discrimination. And just last fall, HUD charged the owners and operators of two apartment buildings in Altoona, Pennsylvania, with violating the Fair Housing Act under familiar status. Uh, in another family uh, case, HUD charged a group in New York, excuse me, in New Hampshire, uh, where the landlord had discriminated <clears throat> when their on site property manager uh, limited the housing option of rental applications. And what they did, the, the families came and had young children, and they actually told them that there were no housing available when they found out that they had children. So these practices are restricted under HUD's umbrella. You cannot discriminate against anyone based on familiar status. And at this time, uh, Angie will talk to you more about uh, discrimination along the lines of disability. So of course, disability is a protected class on the Fair Housing Act. And with disability, um, a few things involved. Um, but overall, HUD is definitely involved in fighting discrimination, of course, with people who are disabled or anyone who's associated with someone with a disability. Disability is it's a common basis of most of our fair housing complaints. The majority of our fair housing complaints are filed because of, as I said, someone who is disabled or someone who's associated with someone being disabled. I've been told that. I've been told that the majority of cases that came in 2017 were from your status and disability. It's not color anymore or race, but those two things. So you guys need to be careful and cautious about familiar status and disability. 55% of our complaints actually arose from disability, and according to what we've been saying, it's potentially a because of disability. So that's a big And more Oklahoma put a charge the landlords of the rental house with, this, with discrimination because they refused to let a veteran um, who had disabilities keep his emotional support animal. And that's a hot topic, emotional support animals. And the department would definitely be doing more education and outreach on that to talk to people about what it is, what it looks like before us, and how it should be handled properly. And we get a lot of questions, Angie, um, in our office about how many animals can I have and is there a breed restriction? And I tell them all the time that it's a reasonable accommodation. And as long as they have a third party that says that the resident needs the animal, they have to allow the animal and that there is no breed restriction. So I'm glad that you all are going to start doing an outreach on that because it's really needed. A lot of, them, uh, a lot of our managers want to treat them as pets. And I have to explain to them they're not pets, and you can't use your pet rules and pet regulations. So I appreciate that. Absolutely, and just to be clear, it is the law. Anyone who has a disability and has the need for an emotional support animal, companion animal, however you want to label it, it can be just considered for a right for them to request a reasonable accommodation. That right should not be taken away from them, even just the right to request one. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that. Uh, you cannot apply the rules for pets to service animals. And that is so true. We have so many misconceptions out there. As uh, a lot of people know, uh, the organization has a right to restrict pets. However, under the Fair Housing Act, uh, a tenant can make a request for reasonable accommodation, as Angie stated earlier, if they have a disability. So, you can make an exception to your rules, regulations, and policies when it comes to persons with disabilities. Right. Right. One thing that we really want to tell people that they be cautious about it is um, individuals who are online selling certificates, um, certifying their animal, um, sometimes at twenty five dollars and up. Um, it's a scam. Oh, it's not. It's a scam. It's the department wants you to know that it's a scam. We want you to be conscious of it. If you have any issues or concerns, contact the local health office. If you have any additional details about it, but just be aware. We try here at Navigate. These Tuesday tips are to educate our managers and our owners. And sometimes every now and then we can have a resident for this. But we try to educate them about fair housing and about the rules and regulations. And I did a session, I think about two weeks ago, on those same items. 
the online certification that I am a service animal, I'm a companion animal, and the handbook, the HUD handbook says that you have to get verification from a doctor or a third party source that knows the condition of the resident, and that person is the person that you get your recommendation from, not www, send us 25 hours and we'll send you a certificate. about discrimination uh, with disability. Now we're going to talk about family. HUD <clears throat> will be continuing uh, its efforts to address discriminatory practices that prevent hardworking families from obtaining the dream of home ownership. You know, that's one of the, the unique things about being an American. You have that opportunity to own a home. And no one should be treated differently or feel that they cannot purchase a home because they've been told that they didn't need prerequisites. Not long ago, the department reached an agreement with a northern Illinois lender, resolving allegations that the lender's business service area included majority of African American and Hispanic neighborhoods. As part of that settlement, the lender established a $1 million loan program that would increase lending in, that, in those areas. Also, in another lender case, uh, HUD reached an agreement with a California credit union, resolving allegations that it denied a couple's mortgage loan application because the wife was on maternity leave. And there are a lot of cases out there where um, women are being told that they cannot purchase homes because they're pregnant. And that is a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Uh, no family should have to choose between a home uh, or their dreams of having children. So neither should the shortage of affordable housing, particularly in high cost areas, deter the dream of owning a home or trying to create a better life. Just last fall, HUD announced an agreement between a group of fair housing advocates uh, in the state of Maryland, and they resolved a complaint alleging the fairness of that state's law when it came to low-income housing tax credits, which we have a lot of programs uh, here in Alabama where people use the light for uh, building housing. And under this agreement, it called for the state to increase the number of affordable housing units in Baltimore region as by as many as 1,500, with more than 1,000 of those being new construction. So lighting is a way that uh, a lot of companies or agencies put funding into building homes. They will match some kind of those dollars. Um, one of the things about, uh, and Angie, feel free to chime in at any time, is our Section 3 program. We did bring you some brochures today. Uh, where people can actually go online and self-certify. Now, when we talk about Section 3, Section 3 is not based on uh, a person's race. It's not based on a sex. It is based on economics. It's an economic status. And what that do does, it brings funding into a community. It provides jobs for low-income personnel. So we have a lot of people that want to start their own businesses. They can self-certify through Hood's uh, Section 3 site on, uh, at www.hood.gov that they are indeed a Section 3 business. Now you're meaning residents. The residents can certify. The residents or a person outside of uh, the residents. I was just saying, anyone interested in being a your own business? Business, okay. yeah. Because as you all know, one of the questions that we ask when we come out to do the MORs on your property for HUD is, do you have any Section 3 business concerns? Mm -hmm. And that's great. Um, the, there was one property I remember, the gentleman lived on the property, but he cut the grass, had a lawn service. And it was the first Section 3 that I had participated in and been aware of, and I was really excited about it. Um, and keep that in mind and keep open-mindedness about your residents who have businesses that might be able to do services for you, such as lawn care or maintenance and things of that nature. Or painting, clerical skills. I mean, there's a multitude of different uh, skill sets that are needed. And this also gives people an opportunity to provide jobs. 
for people. And because nowadays people want to work. It's, it's always the challenge of, challenges of finding those type of work. And then there may be contractors that get different uh, projects that need to be done. And if you have a host of tenants in, in a particular area that have those skill sets, those uh, businesses can actually solicit and to find out, you know, what skill sets they need. And that's one of the uniquenesses about the Section 3 program. When you do new hires, you can hire people who are from those particular areas, low-income personnel, and provide job training uh, activities and opportunities. That's right. Right. The 50 years in, I hope it's the community. The community. The community. Well, we have heard a lot today. There's a lot that you have to decide, especially with the Section 3, because that's an area that we ask you the question on the questionnaire, but most managers say, no, not even realizing what it is. And a lot of times on properties, there are young men who are there who are, as my mother would say, able-bodied. And perhaps some of the new businesses starting up can aid them and they can go on to own a company. I know I was in Maryland working in February and the majority of the gentlemen on the property where we were working, they were floor towers. They laid floor and what have you. And I really wanted to put them in my pocket and bring them back to Birmingham because I have a floor that I need doing. So uh, we encourage you to encourage your residents to participate. As the ladies have said, it's all about the community. And the more we can help our community, the more our properties will shine in that community, be a beacon light. Now, we promise you that you get a chance to ask questions, but I don't know if we have any yet. Ebony, do we have any questions? We do not have any questions as of yet. Okay. No questions as of yet. So, um, the ladies have talked to us about several serious things. Uh, disability discrimination, familial status discrimination. Last Tuesday, we had, uh, I want to call her uh, Chief Nunn, but her name's Annetta Nunn, and she's working now with the Y, and she talked to us about VAWA and about domestic abuse. Next week, we have the people from HICA, from the Hispanic community. And they're going to come and they're going to share some of the issues that our Hispanic population and community here in Birmingham, some of the issues that they have. But in your local community, because we're nationwide, we have four states, Navigate has four states, but we have viewers as far as California, Wyoming, Idaho, and I appreciate you guys sending me the emails telling me how much you appreciate Tuesday Tips and how much you learn. Well, ladies, if we don't have any more questions, we will conclude with what thought would you like to give us? The thought that I would like to give is to remember, although April is Fair Housing Month, every month is Fair Housing Month. A person has an opportunity to live where he or she desires if they can afford and not be discriminated against because of their race, their color, their sex, their national origin, disability, or familial status. Angie? That's a good point. That's good. That's a good point. Thank you. Um, just in closing, I would like for people to remember that HUD is just not a, a department that handles sanctuary housing or low income housing. We are a department that handles the community and the housing needs overall, whether that's funding, whether that be discrimination, investigation, section three, we are totally involved and interested in the community as well. Yes. That's great. Well, until next time, we will see you on Tuesday Tips, and I'd like to thank our guests. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Thank you, Ms. Garner. And we invite you all to come back. Um, during the month of May, we're going to have a kickoff on what we call resident responsibilities. We want to get involved in going into communities and 
hearing from our residents, the things that they feel that they need, and mending the fences between residents and management. So uh, in May, we have an attorney from Legal Aid that's going to come and talk to us about some of those issues. So we look forward to that. And again, I'd like to thank you. No questions, Emily? No questions. Thank you. You all have been a great audience. And thank you for tuning in today. We'll see you next Tuesday. Bye.